from Malaysia, Mr. Mark Rosario. Uh, Mr. Sam Petroda, Chairman. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and thank you for inviting me to speak this morning. I'm, I head the National Innovation Agency in Malaysia and uh, just like to sh uh, share with you this morning uh, what we're doing to implement the National Innovation Strategy. We were established as a statutory body uh, through an act of parliament that was passed in 2010. So we're just about two and a half years old. We started the operations in July 2011. And we are tasked with implementing the National Innovation Strategy, which covers uh, the whole sphere from uh, education all the way to helping the private sector on commercialization. Our key objective is how to create wealth for the country through innovation. We are governed by a governance council, which is the equivalent of uh, a board of directors for a company. So as a statutory body, we have a governance council and the prime minister himself uh, chairs this council that meets uh, every quarter, four times a year. And we have 17 members, just like the National Innovation Council of India. Uh, the members are drawn from government, uh, captains of industry, as well as academia. And uh, apart from the Prime Minister, we also have the Deputy Prime Minister who represents the, the uh, Ministry of Education and six other cabinet ministers and, uh, and the Chief Secretary to the government as well. So uh, this really uh, displays the high importance that uh, the top leadership places on, on innovation and how uh, we see innovation as, as one of the key drivers to helping uh, in our economic transformation program uh, and our goals to, to become a, a fully developed country by the year 2020. As a statutory body, we're actually, uh, the Act of Parliament actually sets out uh, that we are only here for 10 years and uh, after which time we will be uh, uh, dissolved. The reason for that is because a lot of the initiatives that we are trying to put in place at the end of the day should be driven by the private sector and, and continued by, by various other parts of the government. We, we have currently uh, 20 initiatives that, and we, we basically have a multi-pronged approach. If you look at this, uh, this circle, the blue half on the, on the right are actually uh, what we see as having an indirect impact on wealth creation. These are initiatives that are addressing what we call the ecosystem for innovation. So uh, it covers areas from uh, looking uh, firstly at our education system uh, on, the, on the, top, the top right segment, cultivating a thinking culture. We have various initiatives here. Uh, for example, uh, the I Think program is looking at introducing higher order thinking skills into our school curriculum. We have a program that uh, introduced the use of thinking maps in, into the schools and it's being rolled out now uh, across at, for all our 5.5 million uh, school children. This is from K1 to K12. We have an innovation school as well that, that is running a design thinking uh, course. Uh, this is targeted at young working adults and um, the intention here is for them to come out as, as what we call innovation ambassadors. There are uh, other programs as well to, to address uh, the bottom of the pyramid. I, there's, there's a separate session this afternoon, uh, which I, I will also be uh, speaking on. The second segment actually looks at uh, how we could increase the value of our intellectual properties. And there are various programs here as well. Uh, one of them is looking at the whole uh, funding landscape, the grant funding landscape. Uh, we currently have 14 agencies uh, under eight different ministries giving out uh, government grants for research, development and commercialization. And this is an initiative to look at streamlining uh, this whole landscape to ensure there are no gaps uh, in, in the funding all the way to commercialization. We've also created a platform 
to help commercialize uh, intellectual property from our public institutions, our universities, our research institutes, as well as the private sector, where uh, we, this, this platform actually provides opportunities for, for anyone, any Malaysian company, uh, and it's open now internationally, to actually pick up these, these uh, opportunities uh, from the IPs that, that have been uh, identified. And, and the third segment of uh, the addressing the ecosystem is on facilitating industry academia collaboration. And, and here is again you know, trying to tap on the, the, the amount of uh, work and research that has uh, you know, taken place in our academic institutions over the years, how to get our industry and companies to benefit from that. Moving on to the, to the orange segment, the, these are looking at uh, uh, initiatives that have a direct impact on wealth creation. So uh, in, uh, initiatives that would be, have an impact on creating uh, positive GNI and, and job creation uh, in the economy. Where transforming strategic sectors, which is the, the bottom uh, left segment, in the orange segment, this is looking at uh, strategic sectors in the economy and what wealth creation opportunities there are. For example, we have uh, created, a, we have devised a national biomass strategy looking at, uh, well, starting with our palm oil biomass as the second largest producer of, of crude palm oil uh, globally. There's a tremendous amount of biomass and we see tremendous opportunities to create new downstream industries from this biomass create much higher value from what's the biomass being used today. So there's, there's potential to, to create new industries in biochemicals, bioplastics, bioethanols, uh, etc. And uh, the middle orange segment is looking at innovating organizations. This is looking at how we can uh, push our corporates in the private sector to look at what they're doing in innovation uh, we have various programs here, including one uh, which is looking at creating a national uh, corporate innovation index. And finally, uh, catalyzing commercialization is, uh, again, looking at how, uh, apart from, from trying to commercialize the IPs that are sitting on the shelves in our universities and research institutes, also helping the private sector to, to commercialize, uh, you know, uh, what they may have uh, been trying to develop. There's always a struggle, you know, when you see uh, individuals and companies who've put in so much effort to to try and develop something uh, and, and just find some roadblocks just at that step before commercialization. And, and this is where we, we are. We have various uh, programs, uh, including um, having a mandate to, to take strategic equity stakes uh, in, in some of these companies to help them move, make, make that next step. Well, in summary, that, that, that's what we have, and uh, you know, I'm sure we, we can have uh, some discussions on the side. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> next speaker is from Finland, Mr. Petty Peltonen. Good to have you again. Thank you. Well, Mr. Petroda, so Petri Peltonen unfortunately was not able to travel because of some crises over the weekend in Finland. So instead it's Riku Mäkelä, Innovation Councillor from Embassy of Finland, and I'm also the leader of Finnish government's R&D and innovation related operations in India. So distinguished ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Finnish government, I want to thank you, thank Mr. Petroda and his team for inviting us to participate in this Global Innovation Roundtable, as India is one of our strategic partners in global innovation collaboration. In many international comparisons, Finland has been ranked among the most successful nations in the world. And the success lies in long-term investment in education, science, technology, and innovation. Innovation policy, along with educational policy, has formed the core of the Finnish government aiming at developing Finland to a modern innovation and knowledge-driven economy and country. The role of the government has been mainly acting as the coordinator and the facilitator, as well as builder of platforms for making selections and setting up priorities for R&D. 
In Finland, industrial and academic interests have been dealt with the distribution of responsibilities and financing instruments between the Finnish Funding Agency of Technology and Innovation and the Academy of Finland. A recent model, uh, which is called the Strategic Centers for Science, Technology and Innovation, the so-called SHOCs, have been the test case where the two sources of financing have met. The SHOCs have gathered key business and academia experts in their sectors, and they create the basis for a dynamic innovation ecosystem which gives birth to breakthrough innovations of international significance and new international business. And they operate in public-private model where tens of organizations are the shareholders of a private company which operates the R&D and innovation that they are aiming towards. And these shocks have been established in fields that are vital to the future of the Finnish society and industry. They operate in the fields of energy and environment, bioeconomy, information and communications, health and well-being, built environment, as well as metal products and mechanical engineering. Uh, one example of the projects, R&D projects they are doing is a large project in India where the shock in energy and environment sector is piloting a large biomass-based energy production solution. And another example is a large-scale ICT platform for collecting and managing and distributing environmental data in China. Public sector can create a desirable climate that supports R&D and entrepreneurship and encourages innovative companies to seek international growth. Dialogue and a close collaboration between public sector, companies, universities and research institutes have been essential. The development in Finland has been very much company-led and company-centered. The innovative high-growth companies play a crucial role in creating high-paid jobs, improving competitiveness and productivity, as well as promoting a creative renewal of the whole economy. Companies have to be at the front edge of innovation-driven development, both in developed countries as well as in emerging countries. Our aim is to further increase foreign direct investment flows, number of internationally oriented growth companies and venture capital volumes for startup business. A concrete example of these activities in Finland is a startup sauna concept originated from Aalto University and the slush startup events organized around the Europe. Just last week, the biggest startup event of Europe happened in Helsinki called slush. Ladies and gentlemen, cri crises and structural transformation affect all economies in the global markets. As an export-oriented country, Finland is challenged by tough global competition every day. This requires us to renew and diversify our industrial base through high education, research and innovations. We learned some hard lessons just lately after Nokia, our big flagship company, uh, got some global challenges in their businesses. They are still strong, they just sold the non-profitable business division of mobile handsets. So the interdependence of our economies strengthens the crucial importance of international networking and public-private collaboration. Active dialogue across national boundaries is needed, especially when focus is on societal challenges such as environment, water, bioeconomy, energy, transport and health. Finland has been active in supporting market-pulled innovation, stimulation and participating in major EU research and development programs and platforms. We will hear something about EU activities later this morning. Bilateral innovation collaboration, cooperation with global leaders and emerging markets, as well as the EU level, offer us interesting opportunities for enhanced synergies. India continues to be our strategic partner in the co-creation of affordable, scalable, sustainable solutions that are resource efficient. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is from Estonia. Mr. Oliver Vartanan. Thank you, Mr. Sam Pratoga, and uh, thank you to the Indian National Innovation Council for this opportunity to uh, be first of hearing your wonderful country of India, 
and second, uh, to speak in this Global Innovation Roundtable. I feel extremely proud to be the first Estonian here um, <laughs> over the three welcome. years, um, and also uh, be proud to be the smallest country representing um, here and at the round table. Whether this is a positive or a negative thing, we can debate over dinner or lunch later. Ladies and gentlemen, I will focus my uh, uh, speech on three uh, things. First, commitments, um, how our government views innovation and investments into science technology. Second of all, results, uh, where we are today, how do we compare with others? And third, how do, or where do we see our challenges? Estonia defines its main um, innovation goals in the National Competitiveness Strategy of Estonia 2020. It's the overarching strategy for Estonia that the government takes very seriously about. This um, main strategy is also um, the pillar for the government work program that we um, fulfill each year and that's also um, something that is um, then mirrored into our uh, enterprise growth strategy and also into our science and innovation strategy. The commitment I think can be highlighted um, on the graph that I've, sh uh, that I've put on the table. Um, this small blip there that happened in 2009 um, shows a huge decline of Estonian uh, GDP uh, that was around 14%. However, the government uh, saw that investments into science, technology and innovation were the key and shouldn't be, um, shouldn't be decreased in any, in any other way. I must say that although this R&D innovations is a relative um, uh, indicator, um, in 2009 the government took over most of uh, private sector R&D uh, uh, funding and uh, channeled it through its uh, own uh, sources. So we feel very, very committed to uh, innovation, funding, science and um, technology. <laughs> Just to put um, this graph into some kind of perspective, um, in 2000, where this graph uh, started, our investments into R&D were 37 million euros. Today, there are uh, around 379. So that's where, where we are today. Um, looking forward, uh, putting up, uh, us on the map, um, European Union has developed a uh, uh, innovation Union scoreboard, which um, ranks countries into four categories. Estonia is uh, proud to be in the innovation follower category, uh, which we just uh, succeeded to be in two, in two, years, uh, two years ago. Uh, overall, uh, the overall rank for our position is 14th. However, we've seen that we are very, very um, um, rapidly growing in our innovation performance. Uh, the annual growth has been around 7%. Um, where it's been highlighted that we are very strong in investments into R&D, both from the um, private enterprise and also government sector size, but also um, in support services to R&D and innovation. Um, where we lack um, uh, impetus is our will or our um, uh, our way of transforming the science um, and innovation into an economic impact. We see that this is um, the, these are the main areas where we have to focus in, in our next strategies of seven years. We have developed a smart specialization framework in Estonia. Um, which is highlighting some niche areas where, where we want to compete on the global uh, arena. And we see these niche areas in ICT, um, e-government, uh, which um, Estonia is quite famous for health technologies, 
um, we are looking very seriously at individualized and telemedicine applications uh, to our citizens and also resource efficiencies due to our um, economic structure on, uh, on, uh, on the energy fields of oil shale, etc. So, just to conclude, um, we are very keen on um, cooperating uh, with you on all of these uh, three topics uh, to pursue common science technology innovation avenues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is from Egypt, Dr. Dalia Kamal. Yes, thanks, Mr. Sambatula. Good morning, Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Yes. First of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting Egypt to this Global Innovation Roundtable. As a matter of fact, this is the first time for Egypt to participate in this roundtable. And therefore, I am very proud to be here in order to participate in this event. As I'm proud to be the only Arabic country represented in this table. It is an excellent opportunity to be here in India to share and exchange ideas and experiences related to innovation policies and the practices with global innovation leaders. I'm sure this will be of great benefit to all of us as well as to our countries. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know that innovation now is not an option. Actually, it has become now more imperative than ever before. With all the challenges we face every day, especially in a developing country such as Egypt, with a population of more than 85 million people, it is essential not only for economic prosperity, but also for maintaining a more sustainable development and inclusive society. Egypt recognizes very well that the country capacity for innovation and entrepreneurship is critically important to successfully compete in the global marketplace to promote social progress as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the link between ICT and innovation has been well proven everywhere in the modern world. The digital sector is becoming the main enabler to the innovation process. Egypt has recognized that fact early in the journey of development and has successfully mainstreamed the ICT as a part of its national socio-economic development strategy. The government formulated an ICT master plan in 2000 to ensure the development and utilization of ICT for the benefit of all citizens. Accordingly, the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology has dedicated extensive resources during the first decade of the century to enhance and develop the knowledge economy and setting the foundation for innovation and entrepreneurship initiatives. The groundwork achieved in Egypt to support the government vision for the future started with enhancing Egypt's ICT infrastructure, which included establishing a countrywide communication and the data networks, in addition to the meticulous preparations of a highly specialized cadre of knowledge workers. This had helped us to achieve a more than 115% mobile penetration and above 40% internet penetration. Moreover, the development of our ICT industry has played the key role in positioning Egypt among the top 10 offshoring and outsourcing destinations in the world. According to ITU report for Measuring Information Society, Egypt advanced to position 86 in ICT Development Index among 157 countries in 2013, jumping one place from the year before. Despite the current political and economic situations it's currently, currently witnessing. As you know, Egypt is currently passing a difficult time. We do have a lot of challenges and the pressures. Yet we are very determined and focused, not only to maintain the growth of this promising sector, but also to drive all other sectors through digital socio-economic development, which we believe it's our way to achieve prosperity, freedom, and equity. In response to the success of our earlier initiatives, as well as our readiness to move on to the next level of global competitiveness, the ex-Prime Minister of Egypt has announced the establishment of the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center, TIEC, at our main technology park, Smart Village, in 2010. It is to be the place that empowers talented people and small businesses in order to turn original ideas into successful enterprises. 
As a center of business leadership and technology creativity, TIEC aims at developing the technology innovation and promoting the culture of business leadership and entrepreneurship among the youth, who we deeply believe that the future of Egypt is represented by them. Therefore, we consider supporting the startups by young entrepreneurs while instilling a culture of innovation and risk taking are the key drivers of economic growth and the primary objective of this center. Other objectives include the generation of revenue through the intellectual property, the creation of high-end jobs, and the attraction of foreign direct investments. We are confident that achieving all these objectives will clearly add great value to the Egyptian economy. DIEC also works as a catalyst under the public-private partnership framework adopted by the government, academia, industry, and NGOs. Our strategy was officially launched in 2011 with many initiatives that have been identified and described. These initiatives can be broadly categorized into three main layers. The first one is establishing the foundation of innovation and entrepreneurship, and this category was given the highest priority among other initiatives. For example, it includes policy acceleration and advocacy initiative to influence and advocate for significant policy changes that would boost innovation and entrepreneurship in Egypt. Also, we are developing Egypt's ICT innovation and entrepreneurship platform to connect different nodes in national innovation ecosystem and to be a single point of access for business and entrepreneurs who they can learn about innovation-related best practice and find practical support. Innov Egypt is another very powerful program of capacity building through education and the training of university students. We teach them how to generate ideas and how to create innovative solutions to some of the greatest challenges in Egypt using structured techniques. Also, we give them the fundamentals of innovation and entrepreneurship to establish a foundation on which they would build innovative businesses. Recently, we have developed innovation assessment and the certification program for ICT companies using international European standards in order to assist companies to develop their innovative management capabilities and hence in institutionalizing their innovation process. The second category of initiatives will be for empowering businesses through startup support. TIEC supports the entrepreneurial spirit of Egypt's useful workforce with a variety of educational, technological, and financial resources. This includes, but not limited to, technology accelerators and incubators, through which viable ICT startups may receive support in, a, in the form of funding, offering furnished space, and expert advice in taking a product or service to the market. Also providing help for protection of the intellectual property. We also have technology observatory initiative to identify forward-blocking ICT trends and assess their potential economic impact. The third and the final category for recognizing innovation and entrepreneurship. This is to create a culture that celebrates innovation and recognizes key achievements. Also to discover young talents and to help them to take their ideas to the next level. We have different awards program for students, for ICT companies, and for individuals. Through these and other efforts, Egypt is gaining recognition as a serious competitor in world-class innovation and the creative entrepreneurial leadership. Although we still have a long way to go, but do, we do believe that our commitment to innovation and entrepreneurship hold extraordinary promise, not only for Egypt's future, but also for the world. I thank you again for the invitation and for your kind attention, and have a nice and interesting event. Thank you. Our next speaker is from Israel, Mr. Michael Havert. Michael. Thank you. I will go over a short presentation, and I will try to de de describe what we do and how we do. Uh, and we look uh, for innovation as a grow engine of the economy. Uh, for sure, innovation is a central issue in economical prosperity, and we connect the employment and the growth of the economy. We generate new companies in this way, and we create new jobs in this way. 
We are named the Startup Nation because we have very many, many startups in Israel. A generator, Israel is a generator of startups. Uh, every startup list uh, b between three to five years and automatically they exit and after the exit each startup think about the next startup in the last year before the exit. We have a special DNA in uh, the venture capital area. We are questioning everything, we knock on any door, we are not afraid from failures and we can for sure say that uh, we are looking for additional funds to generate and to engine uh, the action of the industry. Examples of venture capital in Israel and investor that are coming from all over the world and they are establishing offices in Israel to attract and to scout technology and new companies and you can see here a variety of uh, venture capital and investor uh, from financial pension fund and to even family officer. I must say that Israel venture capital investment, 75% of our, the money in the venture capital in Israel is coming from foreign money. It's not an Israeli money. It is attractive, attractive to uh, foreign money and foreign funds to put the money in Israeli companies. This is the main idea. And as you see, only 27% or 30% of the funds in Israeli venture capital is real Israeli money. All the other money is coming from outside and it is a signal that uh, the technology and the companies in Israel are very attractive. This is a proven track record of the activity of the venture capital. We can say that we are only second to the Silicon Valley in the number of venture capital. Uh, we can say that it is a growth engine for, of the economy. More than 6,500 startups established, and we have about 100 companies running on the NASDAQ. Another way to bring more money to the game of venture capital and new companies. But we are attractive also to multinational. You can see here a list of multinational opening R&D centers in Israel. Today we have more than 270 R&D centers in Israel of multinational. And you can see also Asian activities starting in the last years. Huawei is coming in, Samsung, uh, and others coming. Singtel from Singapore are coming all, way, all the way to open R&D centers in Israel and to uh, attract uh, technologies and young companies. We can see here the list of uh, Asian activity in Israel venture capital sector and for sure China is a main investor here but also Hong Kong, Korea, and for sure other Taiwan, Singapore, India, Japan, they are all scouting now uh, capabilities in Israel and uh, looking for new opportunities. But the government role here is active. We are actively encouraging activity. We are providing the condition for continuous growth of companies, but we are not replacing the private sector by telling what sector to push forward. We believe in the bottom-up approach and we don't say to anybody what to do. We are only supporting right ideas. We are looking for the bottom-up approach. We are waiting for companies to come and present their capabilities. We are not saying that we are pushing for nano or for life science or for anything else. We are only providing the condition for continuous growth of the companies. If we look to the IP innovation value chain, 
we can sh say that the government look for the high risky projects. We are looking for the high risky project in the beginning of the, st of the stage. Venture capital coming at the step of manufacturing or when the low risk, when there is a low risk and the high return. So we are taking the first step and we lose as a government. First the money is lost and not the venture capital is losing. This is a correct way to optimize the activity between the private sector and the government one. There is uh, many ways to fund, uh, to, to turn an idea to a product. We are looking how is, to, we are looking for the last mile of the development and we are funding projects that are, that can be uh, companies and new product or innovative product. And I will describe now a few of the products, of a few of the pro programs that will help to understand the idea. First of all, we have an R&D fund, a competitive R&D. The budget is about $300 million per year. And the R&D fund, uh, the R&D fund uh, grants uh, between 20 to 50 percent of the total approved budget of the project. And this is a correct way to push forward companies. Uh, we are supporting the better site and uh, we are asking for royalties from the companies wherever they reach the market only by sales. If the project is failed, we are not asking for any royalty back and uh, we are not asking for the loan back. So we can say in a jockey way that we are granting failures, but in this way we build the spirit for entrepreneurial and sharing the risk with the companies. Another way is uh, the traditional industry. It is a special track that is dedicated to traditional industries that uh, their main characterize is the, the low investment in R&D. And uh, this, in this track, we are supporting 50%. We never support more than 50%. And uh, we push the traditional industry forward. Early stage program and startup uh, generator uh, is a program for young companies, less than three years in the market from establishment. Uh, they should have less than 150,000 annually uh, dollars sales. So uh, in this way we push bright ideas forward. Uh, another one is a, a small program, only four million dollars, but very, very attractive. The reason is they come, entrepreneurs come with PowerPoint and they are out of the game by having a beginning of a product or a even uh, writ writing the, the first step in uh, uh, having the patent. Incubator, the incubator system, lo not like in Brazil, we have only 20. <laughs> Very, only 24 inc incubators today, uh, but uh, they are really generating new companies every year. Every year, about 100 companies are out of the incubation system. The incubating system is only for two years, and uh, we are taking in companies, uh, and after two years they become companies that are attractive for venture capital. Uh, but we don't, we have a list of programs that is bridging the academia to the industry. I think this is one of the main clues of how to bridge the innovation to the game. Otherwise, innovation is not connected. So we are connecting with several, and you can see here a list of programs that the main role is to connect the academia to the industry. Examples, uh, the Magnet program, generic R&D support consortia of industrial companies and academic institute. And the target is to jointly develop generic pre-competitive technologies. The idea is, is to transfer basic research to applied research. They don't have product at the end of the day. They have applied research that can be used by the company who are participating in the consortia. This is the main idea. 
only transferring basic research to applied one. Magneton, another program that promotes technology transfer from academia to industry in order to reduce the uncertainty before the technology is used by the firm in new development. Uh, also a program for two years, also to bridge academia to industry, no royalty payments in this case. Another one of our also support applied academic research in specific technology areas, like biotechnology or nano. The same idea, only one year, but only to take ideas outside the academia and to run it to the market. Another one come in, is special in selected applied research, and it is an opportunity for academic research groups with projects at the applied phase. And uh, we believe that in this way we we'll push one more, in a one more uh, uh, effort. And we have also six academic research in nano. They are adjacent to the main university, to the seven universities in Israel. And those six activities are funded by $200 million, but today they are supporting uh, the, industry, uh, the industry by nano ideas. The criteria uh, towards about the mechanism, how we took up, how we pick up the projects. So first of all, we have criteria, clear criteria uh, five criteria on technological aspects, on economic aspects. We are looking for the company capability, but we give the industry to lead, not the academia. Academia can be part only as a subcontractor. We give only the industry to lead and not the academia. Most of the countries is vice versa. But uh, we think a little bit differently. Okay, so we push the the pivot is the academia company, and they can bring the, the, the industry company, they can bring the academia. Uh, the evaluation is very short. In 42 days from application received, we give a decision that it is announced of how much we are going to fund and if the project is clear enough. <coughs> we have a research committee built from nine members headed by the chief scientist in Israel. And uh, the, the main function of the research committee is to decide about the grant and the, uh, and the level of the grants. But we have also international, and here I'm connecting to Anne, uh, to the France. Uh, we have a very strong international collaboration, but also in industrial R&D. We have also in basic science, but we are looking for the industrial R&D because we believe we would like to see, after two years of working together, new innovative product and new innovative companies that come to the market and push the market in a fuel. You can see here a list of about 50 international activities, also with India in a federal level and also in the state level. Today we are working with Karnataka and also in the federal level with the Ministry of Science and Technology. Uh, but uh, we are working in this way uh, with about 50 uh, countries. And tomorrow, in the session of bilateral activities, I will describe better and more uh, loudly about this uh, activity. Uh, if it's not clear what we do, we take an Israeli company and we take a foreign company and we give, le give them to launch together an R&D industrial R&D projects. And we fund it by the two sides, the chief scientist in Israel, and on the other side, it can be an agency or the chief scientist or the equivalent. And in this way, we have sharing knowledge and the intellectual property which is coming out of belongs to the companies. But as I said, I will describe it later uh, tomorrow. I must say that uh, we have done a research on the effect of, uh, of the international R&D collaboration. And uh, today we can say that after looking about 350 uh, companies together, we can say that two thirds of the companies are uh, very productive 
after the collaboration because it's new knowledge, it's new capabilities, and uh, for sure it is the correct way to do, and this is why we are looking how to do it higher and higher. To conclude, business as usual is not an option. We should adopt a bottom-up approach. Uh, we should look for the applied knowledge and less basic research. <coughs> uh, local venture capital continue to lead the early rounds uh, with venture capital. Uh, venture, uh, the, the foreign venture capital are taking the later rounds uh, and partnership for success can play a major role in the global market and for sure government should play the role of uh, as an optimizing of the ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is from UK, Mark Sinclair. Thank you, Mark. I need the um, you need the presenter the tool. Yes, that's yeah. right, please. Thank you. There's a man. Oh, um, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Petroda, and uh, distinguished uh, members of the National Innovation Council. Delighted to be here uh, to present an overview of UK innovation on behalf of the UK government. Um, so, I'm Mark Sinclair. I'm uh, based here in the British High Commission in New Delhi, where I'm also regional director for part of our global UK science and innovation network. Right, straight on, a, a quick um, overview of uh, the background situation in the UK. Um, we, um, our U the UK government has, has said as its top priority, um, restoring growth in a way that's strong, sustainable, balanced across the country and between industries. Over the past couple of years, it's been working with industry and the research base to identify a set of industrial sectors which play to UK's strengths, but also have the biggest uh, potential for impact on growth. So we've, um, we've published 11 sector strategies now, and each is um, underpinned by a long-term strategic partnership with industry. We've also identified a number of technologies, eight in fact, uh, which will underpin these, uh, these sectors and have been putting additional resources in to accelerate their development and commercialization. But it, we see innovation is, is a vital part of achieving this growth strategy. Um, the trick is, how do we deliver innovation? We can see where the ideas come from. Um, we know about, about discovery and imagination, but how do we translate them into some kind of impact? Uh, for example, in the technological area, we have, um, we have one of the strongest science bases in the world, but the challenge is turning that, uh, that world-class science into world-class products and companies. We see we need to break down the barriers that separate our scientific and, uh, and technical expertise from the business and customers that need to um, uh, develop these and benefit from them. So we need this constant conversation, and that's what this slide illustrates, between the, the companies, the researchers, and others to bring ideas to reality. And a wide variety of skills are needed. Uh, the entrepreneurship, the management skills, business skills, manufacturing, etc. the list there. So in the UK, we think we have those skills, but the challenge for our ecosystem is to create this environment which supports the people to develop all of those skills and also supports the partnerships that enables them to come together. So this um, is, a, I'm afraid, a simplified version of the UK innovation system. I mean, it, it, is, it is complex, but I think that reflects the fact that, uh, you know, you need a lot of different organizations and programs to support innovation because the companies, the universities, and the other institutions, you know, that are innovating are so very diverse. Um, the idea of this, this support system, it puts business at the heart. Over on the left, you'll see a range of sort of financial and investment incentives for, um, for supporting innovation, whether it's in R&D tax credits or co-investment uh, through angels or in other investment uh, companies. But also uh, a new one at the bottom there, the patent box, which is enabling companies to, um, uh, to, to exploit their intellectual property in the UK, providing financial incentives to do that. 
And on the right, we have the Technology Strategy Board, the UK's innovation agency, with a whole range of different uh, programs that it uses to support innovation of various types. And I'm going to touch on just a couple of those in a moment. So uh, the first I wanted to mention was the Catapult Centres. Uh, the UK has established this sort of network uh, of centres to, to provide a bridge between the academic and the industry world. Their role is to commercialise new technologies in areas where there's both a large global market opportunity and also a strong UK capability to take advantage of them. And these are, these are, this is a model which has been developed in the UK following a study of innovation systems in a number of countries and then adapted to our own uh, use. So a major feature of them is they're about partnerships. They're often co-located or, um, or, or embedded in universities, but they're very much an, a university and industry partnership. They work with uh, companies, a lot of SMEs as well as big corporations, for, you know, allowing access to specialist facilities and uh, solving, solving their problems. They've been very successful in just their first five years. Uh, they've uh, attracted 1.4 billion pounds worth of public and private sector investment. Another tool I wanted to quickly mention was the knowledge transfer partnerships. This one's been running a very long time, around 35 years in the UK. And basically it, it uh, partners um, an SME with a knowledge institution, a university, and it supports a uh, new graduate to come and work in that company to help them solve a particular problem. It's uh, it just in the last five years, they've done about 1,900 of these projects. And around, uh, it turns out to be rather a good job placement scheme as well, around 80% of the, of the graduates who go and work in SMEs to solve their problems end up getting jobs with them. And this is the model we're currently exploring bringing to India as another way of supporting UK-India partnerships. I think uh, no discussion of uh, innovation is complete without mentioning clusters. So I just wanted to sort of... Uh, uh, give an uh, illustration of just a few of the many clusters that have emerged throughout the UK, uh, just to illustrate the, uh, the variety we have, say, video games in Scotland and microelectronics in the southwest, um, digital creative in London. And we'll also be hearing uh, from Professor Mike Gregory uh, later in the conference around, about the, uh, the Cambridge phenomenon that's uh, uh, so very important to the UK's uh, um, innovation performance. All of this uh, investment in the ecosystem seems to be paying off. Um, we're very pleased the World Economic Forum ranked us uh, second in the world for university industry collaboration, and we're um, doing quite well at third overall in the Global Innovation Index. Just my uh, good friends um, in, in Switzerland and Sweden who seem to be uh, ahead of us at the moment, but I'm sure we'll catch them up one day. Um, but a, a, a more practical uh, measure of uh, success is um, is that this ecosystem can be uh, a, a real attractor for inward investment. And in 2011, 8.8 .8 billion pounds entered the British economy from foreign-owned companies investing in R&D there. And actually, it's created a 4 billion pound sector in the private sector in the UK for independent research and technology organizations who are serving uh, industry's um, uh, research needs. Which brings me on to, uh, to cooperation. Um, and collaboration. We know, we know we have to innovate to remain um, economically competitive and deal with the big challenges that our society faces. And, and we, we can either see the, um, the rise of emerging power, such in India, as, as a threat because of increased competition, but I think we prefer to see the global innovation environment as about competition, as about cooperation, I beg your pardon, as much as it is about competition. I mean, value chains are increasingly global and modern businesses get their ideas and their expertise from many sources. All those dots on the map there, they show, they show uh, research intensity, but it just shows the incredible diversity of, of places in the world where new ideas are being generated, and all of these are potential sources of knowledge for innovation anywhere in the world. environment as about competition, as about cooperation, I beg your pardon, as much as it is about competition. I mean, value chains are increasingly global, and modern businesses get their ideas and their expertise from many sources. All those dots on the map there, they show, they show uh, research intensity, but it just shows the incredible diversity of uh, places in the world where new ideas are being generated, and all of these 
are potential sources of knowledge for innovation anywhere in the world. Uh, certainly in science and technology, there's a very strong and measurable correlation between international collaboration and the quality of research. So if collaborative research is better research, and we believe that's true in innovation as well. So bringing this down to particularly our relationship with India, um, last, last week we celebrated the fifth anniversary of the creation of our Research Council's uh, UK office in India. And we've been um, investing a great deal in our, in our joint re uh, collaborative relationship. We have around 80 research projects going on at the moment. But particularly uh, important is that we have around 90 industry partners involved in these. So really starting to get uh, connections which can translate this new knowledge into ideas. But we need to go beyond that. And that's why last week we were also delighted to... Um, uh, to launch a, an industrial R&D collaboration between the UK and India, our technology strategy board uh, with the Department of Science and Technology through GITA. And this is, uh, again, really uh, trying to accelerate our knowledge into use plan. And finally, my last slide, I mean, I've given you uh, just a very, very brief overview of UK innovation, um, but I wanted to just highlight where we have other UK speakers in the conference who can really flesh out this picture. In the next session, for example, we'll have my good friend Kirsten Bounds talking about institutional frameworks. I mentioned Mike Gregory will be um, telling you about the Cambridge phenomena. And under Innovation for Social Impact, we'll have Jeff Mulgan, the chief exec of Nesta, uh, talking about, um, well, Nesta uh, as an innovation leader in the UK, but also as a leader in support for social innovation. And Manakshi Nath, the head of private sector team in DFID, will talk to you about the very practical support uh, they, are, they are developing for innovation in India. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Our next speaker is from Sweden, Andrea Mariani Schulz. Thank you, Sam Petroda, and thank you all the members of the National Innovation Council for inviting Sweden to this roundtable. Um, last week, the Embassy of Sweden celebrated our annual event, the Sweden-India Nobel Memorial Week, which is a celebration of innovation and creativity. And this is something we have found connects Swedes and Indians. The Nobel Prizes have been awarded in Stockholm to the greatest scientists and the most acclaimed authors since 1901. And uh, this year, 2013, is very special as we celebrate the centenary of the award of the Nobel Prize in Literature to Rabindranath Tagore, India's greatest writer. In the next few minutes, I want to mention something on the innovativeness of Sweden and where it comes from. And then I want to give you some examples of how Swedish organizations in the public and private sector work to support enhance innovation and inclusive growth in the developing world. Sweden is, uh, as been alluded to uh, with my friends from Finland and even the UK, that we're always ranked in the top in many of these global rankings like Global Innovation Index and Innovation Union Scoreboard. And how did uh, Sweden get there? Obviously, Sweden is, a very, is very good at investing in research and education in relation to GDP. Our combined investments in research corresponds to 3.6 of Sweden's GDP. And out of this, the government funds 30% of these outlays through research at universities and research institutes. Uh, seven, more than 70% of the outlay, though, is made by our industry. The amount of money spent doesn't give the full answer. There are many other factors behind Sweden's position as an innovation leader. We have invested heavily in the education system, making Sweden an attractive place for high-tech industry to develop or settle in. And even more importantly, our schools and universities are characterized by critical thinking, communication, cooperation, and creativity. These trends ensure graduates that are self-confident and believe in their own ideas, 
but understand that they have to cooperate with others to bring these ideas to life. We've also seen the importance of allowing failure. Only by knowing that failure is an option, people dare to invest in risky ideas, be it intellectual or monetary investments. And uh, in this context, it would be nice to just add a quote from Tagore. He had written, if you shut your doors to all errors, truth will be sh shut out. Since, 19, since the 1960s, when the Swedish International Development Agency, SIDA, was formed, India has been one of the largest beneficiaries. Lately, the development aid has been focusing on partner-driven cooperation, a way to catalyze sustainable initiatives driven by local organizations with high degree of independence and where project stands a good chance to survive without continuous influx of foreign development support. CEDA recognizes that innovations in technology and business practices are critical for creating opportunities for people living in poverty to improve their li own living conditions. They are therefore conducting a program called Innovations Against Poverty that challenges the private sector to develop products, services, and business models that can contribute to the fight against poverty and climate change. The objectives is to serve as a catalyst for innovation of new products, services, and market systems that benefit people living in poverty rather than helping uh, single companies to do better. The Innovation Against Poverty program in partnership with the British government's business innovation facility run the Practitioner Hub. The Practitioner Hub is an online community and knowledge sharing platform for inclusive business. It provides a space for practitioners to connect, share experiences, and gain new insights to help their inclusive business ventures to grow. At the Hub, a wealth of information concerning inclusive businesses is available. The focus is on what is practical, the nuts and bolts of inclusive business. Most of the resources are firmly uh, rooted in on-the-ground experience from across the developing world. And I invite you all to uh, look at this uh, web resource. The Hub also promotes country-specific networks that provide a space for practitioner working in a specific country to connect and discuss the particular challenges, innovation and opportunities facing inclusive business in, in this particular country. Uh, also the Hub offers an information database on 200 organizations that offer financial or technical support that may be relevant to inclusive business in developing countries. It helps companies and entrepreneurs that are developing inclusive business models to easily find initiatives that could provide the support they need. So while development cooperation plays a decreasing role in the support and cooperation structure between Sweden and India, as the pure bilateral program is winding down, we now focus more on our collaborations in R&D and innovation with academia and industry in Sweden and India. We also see Swedish companies investing in India in a large scale, and they offer a different type of partnership. So far, more than 160 companies have established themselves in India. They do, they do not only contribute to growth of primary and secondary job opportunities, which are estimated to 600,000 jobs right now, but also work closely with their stakeholders in India as part of their sustainability efforts. As an example, in Hyderabad uh, earlier this year, the ambassador participated together with the Honorable Minister for Human Resources Development, Palam Raju, at the inauguration of the Diploma Employment Enhancement Program, a vocational training school set up by the Swedish technology company Saab. Thanks to this initiative, the youth in the area are endowed with the ability to get qualified jobs in nearby industry rather than migrating to the metros to hunt for a low-paid, unqualified job. Further, with the acquired knowledge and the financial degrees of freedom that their employment endows them with, they can contribute to the growth and development in their own villages and towns. 
Later during the conference, Jaideep Gokale and Koshal Chakraborty will present case studies from two other Swedish companies, Tetra Pak and IKEA respectively, of how their sustainable business models add value to stakeholders like suppliers, workers and the environment. Many of the products delivered by Swedish companies can also directly spur innovation and inclusive growth. Take the Swedish innovations in the telecommunications field, which has paved the ground for the explosive growth of mobile connectivity, clearly visible in India with its 900 mobile phone users. Not only has this enabled communication across all parts of the country, but allowed a great number of new innovations based on mobile telephony. One example being the sharing of market prices of agricultural products over mobile phone handsets, which has empowered farmers by letting them know the current market prices and thereby being able to request a fair pay for their products and bypassing the middleman. Many more examples exist in how an innovative country like Sweden can collaborate with India and Indian actors, creating value not only for the established players, but also offering solutions and tools that can strengthen the grassroots and be utilized by social innovators, leading to inclusive growth. However, my time is up now, and I will hand over to the next speaker. I'm confident that uh, this conference will be very, uh, very interesting for all our participants here today and tomorrow, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you.